Hello, I'm Dr. Lewis Hoffman of Saybrook University, and this video lecture is on poetry and interpersonal processes, deepening relationships and promoting healing and growth. This is part five of a six-part series of short video lectures focusing on poetry, healing, and growth. Each of these have been developed for a class that I teach on poetry, healing, and growth at Saybrook University, but are being placed in open access for whoever is interested in them. Some of this lecture will be a bit of a review, building upon topics that have, were talked about in previous lectures and trying to tie them together a little bit. Uh, but in this, we're going to focus on using poetry more intentionally uh, towards healing and growth, in, uh, particularly in some type of a leadership role, such as a therapist or facilitating a, a group, which could be group therapy or other type of therapy. So not, not confining it just to therapy context, but other contexts, primarily from being in a bit of a, a leadership type role. And the topics that are going to cover is safety deepening relationships, and then promoting healing and growth. Safety is something that I've talked about uh, in the context of this in a number of different ways, that uh, poetry is something that, uh, in order to share poetry, a lot of times there's a need for this safe context. So when we talked in some of the early lectures about creating the space, the safety was a, an important aspect of it. And that's going to be uh, even more so when thinking about it in a kind of a facilitation process. But there's this kind of paradoxical aspect to this as far as poetry needing a safe place, but also poetry can help to create a safe place. And within this paradox is the idea that uh, safety is partially created through risk. I think this is something that we often forget about when we talk about safety, is that we can't deepen safety, we can't expand safety without taking some risks. That part of the way that, that safety comes about is by going into places that are not safe and realizing that it's safe. So this is that risk process with it. And so this is part of how poetry works then in creating a safe place, is that poetry generally always reflects some type of a risk when we share it because it's being vulnerable. And so by sharing it, it can create a safer place. It can create a warmer place. It can create uh, more of a container. And this is something that I, I've seen over and over through the years uh, when poetry has been shared about how it can, can transform something. And I'll talk about some specific examples of this. Um, so when poem, some, someone introduces a poem, and this sometimes can be the facilitator. It can be the teacher in a class. It can be the leader in a group but by, through the process of sharing. And sometimes it can be a poem by someone else, and sometimes it can be one's own poem. It helps to deepen and create this safety. Okay, for deepening relationship, then. This is a, a wonderful little quote from Alexandro Jose Gordilia of uh, Cal State Fullerton that he wrote in uh, the foreword to Stay a While, Poetic Narratives on Multiculturalism and Diversity. In all ancient societies, poetry was seen as the purest and most dangerous form of truth and knowledge. Let me read that one more time. In all ancient societies, poetry was seen as the purest and most dangerous form of truth and knowledge. And what Gordelia is really getting at here is this recognition that, that poetry, it, it speaks a type of truth. It often is connected with a spiritual context, that it's, poetry is very common in the a lot of the, the sacred writings across history, a lot of the, uh, in, such as the Bible, the Quran, and other places, often poetry is going to be a part of, of these sacred writings. So it's seen often in connection with these very truthful, pure forms of knowledge. But they can also, with that, can be a, a dangerousness that comes with this truth, with speaking truth. Okay. The sharing of poetry often can help shift to deeper work. And this can happen in different settings, as I've kind of suggested already. One is in the classroom. And I've watched this uh, numerous times in the classroom, 
where when people are in a class we're facilitating a discussion and an engagement around a topic open with the sharing of a poem or shifted to the sharing of a poem along the way and it, the room changed after this you could just you could feel it and the way that people engaged the topic changed they were more willing to open themselves up more willing to talk about how they were impacted more willing to to go to places that they weren't willing to go and examining things before so it can be very powerful there I've seen it very similarly in therapy uh, in a number of different ways that I've seen it when clients have brought in a poem that they've shared with me that they've written and I felt the deeper connection and the, the power but I could also tell that by the accepting they felt the deeper connection as well and it's also happened when, I, when I've shared my, my own poetry or other poems in therapy. Um, there was a particular example uh, in which I shared a poem with a client that I wrote after a session. And uh, I, I mentioned this, I believe, in a previous week it's lecture. And this is something that I think you always want to be a little bit cautious of doing as a therapist. And I, I generally recommend uh, getting some consultation or supervision before doing this. But in this situation, after consulting, it seemed appropriate, and I shared it with the client. And afterwards, her comment was, I always thought that you understood. Now I know. And that was really powerful to her. It deepened her trust. Not just that I was safe, but also her trust that I understood what she was getting at and what she was intending. So it, it really has a lot of power here. And of course, there's a lot of other relationships. I think probably most notable, we think of this in romantic relationships, how sharing poems often will, will deepen uh, romantic relationships. Now, when we talk about promoting healing and go growth, again, I want to emphasize this idea of being intentional, about using it in an intentional way. And th so this is going to be, again, similar to what we've discussed about previously, but really focusing on this idea of being intentional. I'm going to start talking about this in some individual settings and then in, in group settings. And in the individual settings, I think one of the first things is to invite the poetry in, but not force it. When it's forced or there's too much pressure around it, a lot of times it ends up working against what we're trying to accomplish, particularly in this idea of, of de deepening relationships and, and promoting healing and growth. It doesn't feel safe when it's pushed. We might have to make the invitation over and over again, but it's critical that that be done in a soft way, always accepting the no. And even if the person says, yeah, but you can sense that it's not the right time, even sharing that, encouraging that, that let's wait can encourage poetry even if it's not shared. So you may encourage people to start by writing but not sharing. And you can encourage them to short, start with a poem or song that's of someone else's instead of their own. Someone else's that impacted them. That can be a safe way to move into it. Another thing that can often be done is it can be modeled through sharing your own poem first. And this can create safety and, and deepen trust through sharing your own through your own vulnerability now again that's more appropriate in some settings than others in therapy i think you need to be much more cautious about it than what might be in some other contexts and then as i've talked about in one of the previous lectures as well be sure and say something silence uh, can be quite powerful negative at times now when i say say something it doesn't necessarily have to be with words sometimes it can be with other emotions if it brings up tears and you share that and then the, the person reading the poem notices that, that may say more than any words could. Sometimes there can be a nonverbal, that, uh, you know, a soft touch of the hand. Now, again, that may not be appropriate in all therapy contexts, but in many other contexts it may be quite appropriate. That can be a very powerful way of saying something. So it doesn't have to be with words, but it's some way of acknowledging the power of it and of showing acceptance is really critical. Now let's shift to talking about the group context. Now again, invite, encourage, and model. These are, are really important. Invite the poems, encourage the poems maybe by others, 
and model the poems. Now in group contexts, uh, again with exception sometimes of therapy, although I think therapy, it can be used here too uh, with group settings, but in most group contexts, modeling can be particularly important. That in classroom settings, if, if using poetry to engage a topic, I will often lead with a poem. In uh, other types of facilitation uh, discussions, if we're going to be sharing a, a poem in training settings, other things, I often will, will lead with my own and find that that helps to create the safety and the encouragement to be able to do this. And often people will follow that maybe wouldn't otherwise. Now setting the context. Again, you want to be intentional about setting the context, but there can be different ways to do it. Sometimes, and particularly if you're doing it in a therapy setting, you may set some guidelines. So you may discuss guidelines that you've already um, established. However, in other settings, you may discuss guidelines for feedback. Most of the time, I would suggest considering doing a mix where you might uh, set some guidelines about, well, let's make sure that we're that it's focused towards healing. Now, if we're going to focus it towards healing, the feedback towards healing, what are some of the guidelines? And having a discussion about that often facilitates the, the safety. When they're just set, which they need to be in some settings, but when they're just all set, you lose out on that process of discussing. That process of discussing the guidelines, the and the approach that we want to take with feedback creates a safety. So that discussion part, I, I really advocate that whenever you can, have a discussion as part of it, uh, even if you set some guidelines or rules, because of the role that just that discussion about the guidelines uh, for feedback can have. Okay. So again, you may set some and mix some, um, it's a, often good to differentiate between a writing group for healing and for improving writing. Now, even if you're not setting them but you're discussing them, you might just use prompters for some of these. Let's keep in mind that we're using this group with the intention of it being used towards healing and growth. So, given that, what type of guidelines do we want to have for feedback? Now, in that discussion, you may be able to start the discussion without anything set and then bring in your own as well. And one that I think that's important to introduce either through being set or discussed is avoiding critiquing the poem. Again, there's places for that. If you're in a, a group for improving poetry writing skills, of course, critique is essential. But if your group is focused on healing and growth at a personal level, then want to avoid critiquing the poem. Avoiding analyzing the person and poet. Most places, even in therapy, you want to avoid getting too much into analyzing the person and poet in that group setting. Now, you might discuss some of it. You might um, use the technique we talked about in a previous lecture about if this were my poem, this is what it would represent. You might ask the poem, could it have meant this? Uh, but you don't want to be pronouncing what the poem was conveying or what the poem was meaning or saying. That often creates a lack of safety or introduces a lack of safety. So this is a good thing to avoid. And then encourage multiple meetings. Now this may be done not through the guidelines, although I think it often is good to, to have a guideline in there that let's keep in mind that poems can have multiple meanings to them. And they can mean different things to different people. But you can also model this by, as you're going through, you can model all of these as you're going through by doing that. So for example, if a person brings in a meaning that, that seems to fit, you can say, you know, that's a good meaning. I, I, that really resonates for me. There's another one that resonates for me. And so you're showing how they both can fit in there through the modeling of it instead of um, just by saying it. And with all of these then, modeling it helps. Modeling by giving feedback without critiquing. Modeling by really focusing on that healing. When you're in the leader role, it's also important to be able to, to be ready to gently refocus when necessary. So when someone starts critiquing, to be able to say, you know, that's a very 
interesting insight. However, let's keep in mind the setting that we're in. Sometimes it might just be a gentle reminder, even signaling to someone, you know, to let's stop here and, and refocus it. But this becomes really important because when you breach that safety, it can take a while to get it back in, particularly when it's a certain type, such as the critiquing or the analyzing the person. Because then the person's going to, the readers are still going to be sitting there thinking, they're critiquing me even if they're not saying it. They're analyzing me even if they're not saying it. So it's very important to, to step in and be courageous about this and doing it quickly, but not to do it in a shaming way, just in a, as in a reminder, a guiding back. In the group facilitation, it's also important to watch for the quiet voices. Sometimes the quiet voices just need some direct encouragement. I notice you haven't said anything. Do you have something that you would like to, to contribute, a poem or, or your thoughts about a poem? So just that, that encouragement. But again, don't require, don't pressure. Encourage, invite. You know, that, that constant soft invitation without the pressure is what you're striving towards with this. If the person is tentative, you may encourage them to start with other contributions, such as giving feedback or such as saying, if this were my poem, you might even just ask directly to someone who's been struggling to, to feel safe to contribute. If this is your poem, what might it mean? And you might uh, encourage them to begin by sharing some of their, their favorites or poems that were other poems or songs that have impacted them before sharing their own. Now, the other side of it is it's important to prevent one voice from overtaking the group, which can also ha often happen. And so if you find one voice becoming particularly strong, just being able to create the space for the others. Often it's best by starting by creating the space for others. And if need be, giving them more direct feedback of, you know, I've, I've noticed you've had a lot to say tonight. Um, I want to make sure that other people also have um, time to share what they're thinking about. Uh, and often you can do that with some, you know, integrate some praise in there because it, it does help when you have someone that's active and, uh, and often their intentions are very good. And so uh, being able to recognize that, but also guide it so that everyone has some space is important. Uh, another way that you can do that is just uh, noting that I've noticed you've had a lot to say and there's some people who haven't had the chance to speak tonight. Let me give them a chance first and we'll come back to you. Uh, some of these things may seem very basic but they can be difficult to do particularly if you've not been in the role of facilitation very often before. But the group facilitation is I think quite powerful and so it's a uh, it's a great place to to be able to try and do this it can often be much more powerful than those individual you can introduce different styles of poems and these can be your poems or poems from others again this starts to help free things up as if people are all sharing a very similar style of poem that can easily develop into an expectation into where people are don't feel safe sharing different types of poems. So being intentional about bringing in different types of poems. If you notice all of them are rhyming, well, bringing in some poems that don't, yours or other people's. If uh, they're very structured poems, well, bringing in some more uh, open verse can be very helpful. Typically, you want to balance the structure and format. Some structure is important for safety, um, but then also some openness is important. And my tendency is to go as much with the openness as, as possible and, and maybe sometimes too much with that openness of really following where the energy of the group is going. And that can work quite well, particularly if you are good at being able to engage and gently guide without overtaking and, and able to read the energy of the group and kind of follow it. That can work quite well. Um, it can also work quite well if the if it's a group that's open and willing to share, but it's a little more difficult if the group is not as open to sharing, if there's not as much safety, then you may need to rely a little bit on structure. So being able to shift between more structure and less structure it can be a, a very helpful art. And you can think about that, you know, poetry as examples of that, is that uh, 
And again, sometimes structured poems are very helpful for people in starting out writing because it gives them some guidelines so that they know, all right, I'm, I'm writing something that really is poetry. And then over time, they can, can let up on that and follow what comes natural for them, whether it be something that does have some structure or rhyme or something that's more free verse. So that there's some parallels between that of following uh, that openness and, and using the structure. Activities can often be helpful to try out new approaches, and that can be part of the structure. But be careful not to um, be too rigid with the structure, not to rely too much on the structure, because again, that can uh, squash the creativity and limit the creativity in a lot of ways. And one thing that I really suggest is always give an out. So if you're doing an activity, you introduce the activity, and then I generally will always say, uh, if, if this just doesn't fit for you, Write what you know a poem on whatever you feel called to right now, or if you don't have a poem right now, draw something or or just journal. And a lot of times journals might turn into a poem. And so I'll tell them this is that writing these other uh, formats, writing a narrative, a journal, drawing a picture, or some other creative outlet may turn into a poem. So, and so that's okay, but give permission. I'll also gently say you maybe have had something that's begun to percolate, a poem that begins has begun to percolate as we've gone through and uh, that you really want to focus on and it's not in line with activity. By all means, follow what's percolating because that's that seems to be calling you at the moment and you don't want to uh, to lose that or stifle that. So giving an out is often uh, a quite important part of, of the process. You know, there's... Uh, also, the, the consideration of do you write the poems in or outside of the group, and that, that's something you may discuss early on. Often it's helpful to bring in poems. Um, I'll often mix with bringing in some and creating some space for it. Um, encourage people, you know, if it's an ongoing thing where you're going to meet more than once, you know, you may start a poem and finish it uh, between times we meet. So there's a lot of different ways that you can go, you can go about this. But, Again, giving that flexibility to people, I think, is really important for creative space. Okay. All right, so this is the conclusion of this brief lecture on using poetry in a more intentional way to promote healing, growth, and deepening of relationships. Thank you.